Okay, um, excellent. Thank you so much. My name is Dr. Carla Delegata. I'm going to share some slides right here. Um, I hope that you can all see me. Okay. Um, hi, I am Carla Delegata. I am an assistant professor of English, and I wish to begin by thanking um, the organizers for the invitation to present um, this morning uh, or this evening. Um, for all of you, and to put me in direct conversation with my wonderful colleague in Australia, Dr. David McInnes. My work over the last decade has focused on the intersections of Shakespeare and Latinx culture, or Latinidad. In the United States, Latinx peoples, or those descended from Spanish conquest, comprise more than 18% of the population, the country's largest ethnic group. Um, Racial and ethnic categories, as defined by the U.S. Census, distinguish four races, white, black, indigenous, and Asian, and one ethnicity, Hispanic, um, Latino. Hispanic is a term derived from language for the peoples of Spanish language dominant countries, including Spain and most of Central and South America. And Latino is a geographic term for the people of the Americas that descend from Spanish conquest. Um, Latino, Latina, Latin with an at symbol, Latinx, Latine, Latine, all of these terms um, are contemporary terms that are used today. Bilingualism, um, or Spanglish, the mixing of Spanish and English, and code switching all form part of Latinx identity and the generational changes that can be marked in part by language shifts. Latinx are faced with the heterogeneity of Latinidad including those that do not speak the language or languages of their heritage. Bilingualism, semi-bilingualism, and language play vary across localities and individual experiences. Because Latinx peoples can be of any race, white, black, indigenous, and Asian, when Latinx culture is performed on stage, the visual identification of Latinx bodies is less dependable, and the amplification of the oral becomes necessary. The emphasis on the oral is an original practice of Shakespearean performance, and it is something that adaptation through the musical genre and or through translation can draw on. Language is often what brings people to Shakespeare, but it can also be used to subvert patriarchal and colonialist histories. In the history of American Shakespearean performance, much has been written about the, the intersection of Black performers and Shakespeare and Black bodies on the stage. And my work joins the conversation about Shakespeare and race by attending to deliberately crafted portrayals of ethnicity. I have tracked over 150 Latinx themed Shakespeare productions. This wide and diverse history brought me to two books, the first a collection with 25 contributors, including um, scholars, playwrights, dramaturgs, acting instructors, and directors on the myriad intersections of Shakespeare and Latinidad. The second is a study comprised of various case studies on Latinx Shakespeare's or Latinx themed Shakespeare productions in big and small theaters throughout the United States, all with various strategies for staging Latinidad and Shakespeare. These productions mix languages and time periods. Latinx people educated in the United States are guaranteed to learn some Shakespeare, though they may not learn any Spanish. Latinx Shakespeare's can reinforce the association of Latinidad with Spanish, but also through the inclusion of additional languages, including indigenous languages, break down that binary. Just as Spanglish and Latinx language play extend outside of English and Spanish, Latinx Shakespeare speak in two modes simultaneously to create something bigger that is both Shakespeare and Latinx theater. The intermixing of Shakespearean English, modern day Spanish, and indigenous languages in Latinx Shakespeare's renegotiates perceptions of Latinx people. Orality serves as both marker and purity test for ethnicity, and I will go over some terms. Um, orality is interpreted in our daily life and represented in art through literary, sonic, and visual signifiers. 
There are several components of orality that inform these productions and any production of ethnicized Shakespeare's. Cross temporal code switching, um, what I have termed the movement between languages from different time periods, reflects an inchoate idea of the relationship between ethnicity and language. It shifts the dialogue outside of any specific time period. Sound tells us something certain, or tells us certain things about culture, and cross temporal code switching modernizes Shakespeare's text while it ethnicizes. It facilitates understanding for audiences who may not speak any of the languages fluently and demonstrates how polyphony remakes the world both more richly and accurately. For example, in Romeo and Juliet, Benvolio's first greeting to Romeo is good morrow cousin. And very often in Latinx Shakespeare's, this is changed to buenos dias cousin. Buenos dias is much easier for many people to understand than good morrow. Um, even if they don't speak Spanish. But translating cousin, which is used more than 20 times in the play, can be quite difficult, as it can mean primo, tío, hombre, cabrón, amigo, or it translates um, quite variously. <clears throat> the, La the Latinx soundscape is inclusive of language, accent, music, sound effects, silences, and noise all of which contribute to a Latinx Shakespearean acoustomology that is a performance of oral excess, which I term oralidad. Oralidad is actually not a word in Spanish. Um, it is not a direct translation of orality, but oralidad connotes the rich oral elements germane to the performance of Latinx cultures. I use the term oralidad to signal the constant tension of understanding and misunderstanding of the act of translation that is always imperfect and often beautiful because it demands an alteration of terms and form. And as a constant reminder that in the theater that is Latinx Shakespeare's, we read and hear between languages to create new meaning. In their work on sound and theater, Lynn Kendrick and David Rosner expand the elements of orality, stating oral elements, quote, all agitate received ideas of ocular centric theater semiosis. The desire to focus on the oral extends outside of theater studies to socio-historical research and into the shaping of racial categories. In his study of the role of music in American racial formation, Josh Kuhn uses the phrase, quote, the American audio racial imagination, and what Jennifer Lynn Stover calls, quote, the sonic color line, end quote, functions, quote, as an externally imposed difference. While sound theorists make evident that sound has helped to define racial categories, these formulations typically address race, but not ethnicity. Any study of Latinx, the theater and beyond, requires an attunement to auditory signifiers of culture, especially Latinx who are either racially white or racially black, as the oral distinction may be more prominent than the visual or may be the only outward difference at all. The richness of a realidad includes a heightened language play, which may take one or more forms within the world of a play or production. Different types of language play are evidence, for example, in Romeo and Juliet adaptations that speak where the lovers speak English to each other and Spanish to their parents, or one house speaks Spanish and the other house speaks English. Or in the immigrant characters in Twelfth Night and the Comedy of, er of Errors who speak their home language when re reunited with their lost relatives. This language play becomes a crucial step towards creating an identity of these characters and of giving them a history through the legacies of colonization, assimilation, and immigration. But the work of theater encompasses more power and analytic awareness than that. Even as more Latinx people do not speak Spanish, oralidad is a savvy and oftentimes necessary means for theatrically engaging with Latinidad. With inclusion and a commitment to exploration, Oralidad connotes a variety of expressive and specific oral components that integrate Latinx culture with Shakespeare's language and the command of vocality required for both contemporary linguistic code switching and Shakespearean acting. These examples I will share um, reveal a Latinx acoustomology a uh, portmanteau for acoustic epistemology, and a term that Stephen Feld coined, quote, to express the particular ways 
cultures experience their knowledge of the world through sound. The centrality of acoustomology as a practice of identity begins to offer an alternative model of difference making to the strong arm of visuality. A Latinx acoustomology for Shakespeare includes a realidad, the aural excess that counters and enriches an unreliable recognition of the visual of Latinx bodies on stage. Shakespeare invites this process through the openness of his language and in the unremarkable settings of some of his plays. For example, Verona does not factor into the characterization, plot, or physical spaces of Romeo and Juliet, and measure for measure setting in Vienna is likewise irrelevant, as are the Italian names of its characters. Acoustomology is about meaning. In Marcus Cheng Chai Tan's impressive research on acoustic interculturalism, he writes, acoustomology establishes sound as culturally determined and symbiotic to cultural spaces. In Latinx Shakespeare's, the complexity of linguistic difference becomes a powerful interpretive tool for both performers and audiences to open up the nuances of identity and to reformulate the category of Latinx. Indeed, the heteroglossic language play, or the expression of two or more viewpoints through the intermixing of two or more languages, of Latinx is inherently liminal. This liminality is germane to Latinidad, and, and indeed can counter stereotypes about linguistic deficiency or the valorization of language purity. In Borderlands La Frontera, Gloria Anzaldúa lists eight different forms of Chicanx language and argues that, quote, ethnic identity is twin skin to linguistic identity. I am my language. Movement between languages is part of the Latinx experience, often even for those who consider themselves monolingual English speakers. The inclusion of slang, verbal expressions, and the application of syntax from one language to the words of another are all forms of language play. Likewise, Shakespeare's dialogue brings together words from a breadth of etymological sources, and it shaped and solidified the English language. Shakespeare's heteroglossia confounds a perceived purity of English, and Latinx language play amplifies this faulty perception. Latinx Shakespeare's combine these histories and strategies for the theater, placing greater emphasis on the oral to discern Latinidad and Shakespearean meaning together on stage. For example, in Edith Villarreal's The Language of Flowers, um, this is a Romeo and Juliet adaptation that ran for um, in several productions um, in the early 1990s. It takes place in a contemporary Los Angeles with Romeo Martinez as an undocumented Latino and Juliet Bosque as a wealthy third generation Chicana or someone of Mexican descent who does not speak Spanish. The Corilista or chorus gives the opening prologue and switches between English and Spanish. In Villarreal's script, she denoted the use of a Spanish accent by underlining the words. So even when the words are spoken in English, it was a deliberate design of the soundscape to use accented English in conjunction with unaccented English. And we all have an accent, but I mean a Spanish accented English and an unspanish accented English um, to give the characters a background and context, noting that the soundscape can offer, can offer that opportunity even without changing any dialogue. In another linguistic dramaturgical strategy, um, Henry Godinus's Romeo y Julieta from Chicago Shakespeare in 2008 created a society of Capulets and Montagues that moved both um, between languages. Here you can see the original Shakespearean English in black, and I put the contemporary Spanish in red. Both languages come together in line five with Morona, which is the same word in English as it is in Spanish. Two households, dos casas, both alike in dignity, ambas en noblesa iguales, en la bella and fair Verona. It's difficult to speak like that, even though I am bilingual, but I do not mix Elizabethan English in with contemporary Spanish. Cross temporal code switching is outside the norm of the way anyone speaks um, in our world today. While this type of shifting between languages might be difficult for some monolingual audiences, and in fact, some bilingual actors and scholars, as most actors have not been trained to act in more than one language and directors are not trained to direct in more than one language, it creates a fundamentally different sonic experience for the audience. Beyond the strategies to make the soundscape a signifier for Latinidad, 
I argue that in using the oral to theatrically depict Latinx, this theatrical work engages the audience in a differently sensorial world. This perspective shares socio-cultural sensibilities with liminal and border experiences of between both and and minoritized or marginalized points of view that might not otherwise be visible to the still mostly white upper middle class audiences of prominent regional and repertory theaters in the United States. The cultural political work enabled by introducing audiences to Latinx characters mediated through the quote legitimacy of Shakespeare permits the discernment of Latinidad and Shakespearean meaning together on stage. Attuning to Latinidad provides recognition of representation, but it also moves an audience into the spaces of liminality, an experience provided by Latinx theaters, but rarely by Shakespeare. In the interstices of the two, or the borderlands, an audience might not otherwise encounter this linguistic experience of bilingualism, but it's invited to be immersed in it for over two hours. Latinx themed Shakespeare productions challenge ideas about temporality by creating a Latinx world in disjunction with Shakespeare and in disjunction with our world today. They engage a soundscape outside the limits of linear time, one that emphasizes a realidad as a form of agency that combats dual forces of linguistic racism, both forces inherent as and Shakespeare as gatekeeper and those prevalent in the United States today. Because the soundscape is not temporally situated, the elite standing of Shakespearean linguistic he hegemony fractures, easing understanding for those who may find it daunting and creating new meaning and creative practices as well. For decades, the sound of Spanish and the Latinx body were perceived as disjunctive to Shakespearean language and stories. Any notions of a fixed Latinx identity to represent through Shakespeare or through language from two different time periods confounds the possibilities of mimetic representation. It is through this linguistic impossibility of mimesis in Latinx Shakespeare's that productions engage the soundscape to make Latinx recognizable for all audiences. Oral excess and a Latinx acoustomology for Shakespeare make evident that the sound case is cross temporal and therefore Latinidad is too. Take, for example, the linguistic dramaturgy of having a cast, the same cast, perform the same play and production in two languages. A solo repertory's Hamlet, Prince of Cuba, had the entire cast perform the show in two languages. Artistic director Michael Donald Edwards made numerous cuts to the play. And um, Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Nilo Cruz did the translation. Cruz's translation wasn't Castilian as in Shakespeare's time, and it was not iambic. In so doing, he mixed the Canarian Spanish of Cuba, or the Caribbean of Central Americas, creating a Spanish translation that crossed regional dialects and phrases. Performances ran in English for the first month, followed by two performances in Spanish with English supertitles at the end of the run. The show then moved to Miami for a weekend. The adaptation was set in Cuba and Shakespeare's language was unchanged in English. The time period was 1898, the year the Americans invaded Cuba and took hold of the Philippines and Puerto Rico. To note, there were never any princes of Cuba. The production setting is anachronistic as is the cross temporal code switching for actors to perform one night in Spanish and perform another night in English. Changing the language changes the images and therefore will change the production as translation often does. Those who were not necessarily bilingual had, um, and most had never performed in, in Spanish. The actor who played the lead role, who you see um, censured here, um, Frankie J. Alvarez, is Cuban American and a native of South Florida. But the cast also inclu included a King Claudius who was Mexican, Ophelia was from Ecuador, and Laertes Polonius and the player King were all Cuban. There was also a Spaniard, Brazilian, um, and, and lots of um, gringo Americans as well. With this cast, Edward said, quote, we are in the process of shaping the American character. Indeed, Alvarez was the first Latinx actor to play Hamlet as a Latino or Latin American on any major regional stage ever in the history of the United States, and that was only 10 years ago. Sueño, an adaptation of Midsummer, A Midsummer Night's Dream, um, Sueño means dream in Spanish, was set in a Caribbean carnival aesthetic, 
likewise had the same, um, the same linguistic dramaturgy and had the cast perform the entire show in two distinct languages on alternating nights. Teatro Sea cast dancers and puppeteers and the actors had to control puppets. Here you see one actor on stilts um, and all of the actors had to be bilingual and be able to move um, in with the choreography to the live orchestra. The play is written in prose with only the mechanicals and Oberon speaking some verse directly from Shakespeare. The production included 65 puppets, most of which were darker in quote skin tone to convey Afro-Caribbean peoples while not focusing directly on the actor's body. This displaces the visual of the actor's body and puts it onto something that is, again, not mimetic, large puppets, small puppets, um, and varying different um, um, lighting scopes for, for the background. Um, the casting call was advertised with dance as the priority, quote, seeking a professional level of modern and or contemporary dance experience in Afro-Caribbean dance as a plus. The creative and performance teams included those from Uruguay, Dominican Republic, from the United States, Spain, Puerto Rico, El Salvador, Mexico, Peru, England, Cuba, Brazil, Colombia, Holland, Canada, and China. Ultimately, a realidad functions as an effective register for Latinx agency to subvert Shakespearean linguistic hegemony. Stuart Hall describes, quote, the whole repertoire of imagery and visual effects through which difference is represented at any one historical moment as, quote, a, re a regime of representation. Like Hall, with his focus on visual effects, most Shakespearean and most theatrical representations have traditionally employed visual semiotics. But with Latinidad, the regime of representation is tied to the affect that is invoked through the auditory, including the wide scope of the soundscape. Staging Latinidad, which always includes an excess of the oral, subverts the dominant theatrical language that does not include words or ideas to depict Latinx, the language of Shakespeare. The unification of Latinx and Shakespeare demonstrates not just their compatibility, but a better understanding of both. Latinx as a culture, temporality, and acoustomology is the narrative device that Shakespeare does not offer, for there are no Latinx characters in Shakespeare. Latinx peoples are not part of the Shakespearean or not part of Shakespearean plays directly. There are only three references to Mexico and the Merchant of Venice, and the island colonial play of the Tempest nods to the Americas. Shakespeare's plays have the capacity to integrate with Latinidad in all of these ways due to the spaces of the poetry or what playwright Paula Vogel describes as epic form or quote linear with gaps and scholar Emma Smith calls gappiness. This openness permits space for the, vision, for the very liminality that is necessary for, La, for Latinidad to be present. While there are never cohesive viewing experiences across audience members, Latinx Shakespearean productions offer an example of how varied experiences with the soundscape can challenge the visual strategies of theater for the theatrical recognition of race and ethnicity. I can offer numerous examples of how this functions, but here is an image from Caramia's Romeo and Julieta, performed for, um, largely for the theater's Latinx audiences in Dallas, Texas. Spanish, Spanish language music, Latinx actors, and Shakespeare's verse in English all mixed together to tell the story. For audiences to attune to Latinidad, they must negotiate their experience with Latinx cultures and the Spanish language and their own experiences and position. Scholar John Rossini attests that ethnicity is constructed by the spectator and the dramaturgical elements used to foster the perception and discernment of Latinidad vary across theaters and audiences. How we hear is subjective and based on numerous factors outside what is presented on the stage. Sound theorist Ross Brown notes, quote, the categories of oral dramaturgy are not fixed but determined in the cultured ear of the listener. Here then we come to orality, the subjective phenomenology of hearing. Audience members bring with them their cultural backgrounds, experiences, biases, and corporeal abilities for listening. The concept of orality points to one of the underlying questions of Latinx Shakespeare's, who is Latinidad being performed for and to what effect on the Shakespearean stage. 
For the monolingual English speaking audience, the dialogue in Spanish could become a form of white noise, or rather perhaps a brown noise. The reprieve granted by an unfamiliar foreign language spoken by Latinx and Hispanic actors that offers an oral respite from the taxing high poetry of, in English of Shakespeare. For audience members conversant in Spanish, Spanish offered greater access to points of humor, intimacy, and tertiary characters. Alicia Arizon notes, quote, in society as a whole, language serves both to differentiate power from culture and to interweave the two. The soundscape of Latinx Shakespeare's exemplifies this for the theater. The Zoot Suit Romeo and Juliet um, that you can see an image from here in 2004 in Los Angeles was designed um, to be set during the 1943 Zoot Suit riots. This is an important piece of Los Angeles history and one that audiences in this theater were quite familiar with. Zoot Suit also recalls Luis Valdez's famous 1979 musical um, by the same name starring Edward James Olmos, which is a hallmark Latinx play, one that defines um, modern and contemporary Latinx theater and is usually noted as kind of the beginning of, of contemporary Latinx theater today. Valdez's Zoot Suit marked a shift from his activist wagon theater of El Teatro Campesino to what would become the genre of contemporary Latino theater. Tony Plana's 2004 adaptation melded elements of, the, of Latino theater and Shakespearean performance together with musicality um, as well as verse. Shakespearean actors are known for their virtuosity of speech and Latinx language play is key to identity. More importantly, these productions represent the United States as it is and has always been multilingual. Because representations of Latinidad are so heavily marked by language, they make for a ripe encounter with Shakespeare. The mixing of Elizabethan and Jacobean English with modern day Spanish makes a crack, a crack in the temporal border creating a liminal space that allows for an opening um, for language justice or quote, the right everyone has to communicate in the language in which they feel most comfortable, end quote. The language play and the foregrounding of Spanish alongside Shakespeare foster this sense of justice because in the, word, in the words of Alfred Arteaga, the Spanish quote, undercuts claims of prevalence, centrality and superiority and confirms the condition of heteroglossia. It draws the monologue into dialogue. In short, it dialogizes the authoritative discourse. The oral pathway fights linguistic hegemony and expands ideas about identity, and it does so through the creativity of the theater. Because Latinx Shakespeare's involve a soundscape and therefore an ethnicity outside of a singular temporality, the audience must use creativity to make meaning. Ross Brown writes, quote, if sound is elemental to theater as a building and a live event, then acoustomology is fundamental to dramaturgy, which deals with meaning and must therefore understand that audiences know sound only as they are equipped, culturally equipped to. Today, there are bilingual Shakespeare's being produced, released as audio tracks and freely available to the public including the public's Romeo and Julieta, starring Lupita Nyong'o, which shifted between Spanish and English and included subtitles throughout. Rather than explicitly depicting Latinx culture, the bilingualism was the concept for the production, making central that language play is a connotation of American culture. Seattle Shakespeare produced Meme Garcia's House of Sueños, an appropriation of Hamlet's themes that mixes contemporary English, Shakespearean English, and Spanishes from various regions and time periods to tell a story of personal and cultural loss. This work presses on orality as a key strategy for Shakespearean performance, not merely as an original practice of Shakespearean theater, but also as a means to integrate marginalized groups into Shakespearean stories and ethnic culture into modes of storytelling. It is in this work, the cohabitation of Shakespeare and orality that I argue makes possible the performance of Shakespeare as ethnic theater. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your insightful theme address. May I now request today's second theme speaker, Dr. David McInnes, sir, to enlighten us on the topic, blended learning, virtual reality, and student collaboration in the Shakespeare classroom. For the next 25 to 30 minutes, the floor is yours, sir. 
Thank you so much. Let me see if I can share my screen. Does that look right? Again, yes, sir, we can see, sir. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'd like to also thank the organizers and thank my colleague Carla Delegata for that wonderful paper. That's a really tough act to follow. That was so fascinating. I want to pick up on the theme of uh, disrupting the hegemony of Shakespeare to some extent, but I want to focus on pedagogy and the classroom experience. So this paper is a little bit more reflective uh, and less research driven and more teaching oriented, I suppose. Uh, it's about, it's a story in some ways about my experiences in the classroom at the University of Melbourne. I've been there for the last 10 years now. Uh, when I began this role teaching Shakespeare in Melbourne, it was still largely the case that there would be a formal lecture uh, and we would study the texts of Shakespeare. Students who watched a film version were typically taking the easy um, uh, easy option, I guess, instead of battling with the text. And historicizing seemed to be the main way of understanding the plays. So I've been trying to change that. And uh, defamiliarizing Shakespeare, I think, is probably the best way of describing what my principle for pedagogy is. I want students to forget everything they think they know about Shakespeare and to approach it with fresh eyes instead. And part of that means renegotiating the learning contract, if you like. It means me being present in the classroom and having expertise, but spreading or dispersing that authority around the classroom and ensuring that everyone's voice gets the chance to be heard. I value the different perspectives of my students and that what they can bring to the classroom uh, to give me in turn new insights. So in 2016, so about four years after I started teaching at the University of Melbourne, the university opened a new building, an Arts West building, it was called, because the arts, the old arts building was just adjacent to it, this is slightly to the west. Uh, the recipient of numerous architectural awards, it offers innovative and varied teaching spaces designed to encourage experimentation with pedagogy. In response to this opportunity, I departed from the traditional 90-minute uh, lecture and 60-minute tutorial model and implemented a blended learning approach combining uh, some unique online content with active performance oriented activities in seminars. And that's what you're looking at right there. I've got a few pictures from my classrooms um, or with student permissions, of course. Collaborating with the Melbourne University Shakespeare Company and the Faculty of Arts e-teaching unit, I produced a series of short scenes from Shakespeare for my course, Shakespeare in Performance, primarily between 2015 and 2018. Uh, I'm still creating that content occasionally now, uh, but there was an initial period of really investing heavily in that to set up the course. This material, importantly, is not available elsewhere. It has therefore not been encountered by my students previously. So we don't get a sense that they've already seen the Kenneth Branagh Hamlet, they know what they think about it, or perhaps what their high school teachers has told them to think about it, and they just regurgitate that in class. Instead, they're seeing original content, and they have to respond on the spot. More importantly, this original content features the students' own peers performing key roles from Shakespeare. This is where the collaboration comes in. Thus facilitating a level of engagement not often found when professional actors perform and the students have a, a sense of inequality or disparity in terms of that power dynamic. Uh, they sense the need to respect the actors, the professional actors for their craft, uh, and they perhaps feel uh, less inclined to venture an opinion, especially a critical opinion, about what they're watching, because they instinctively assume that the actors and the directors know best, and who are they to question it or to pass judgment. A lot of that inequality leaves the classroom when they see their own age group, their own fellow students on the screen instead. And so I'd like to share with you a number of these short films and evaluate what has worked well and what might benefit from some further refinement. Each year is an example of uh, tinkering with the course further, adjusting things that haven't worked so well, uh, working more with the things that have worked well. And just some brief background here too. The Shakespeare in Performance course is currently the only subject entirely dedicated to Shakespeare um, in the undergraduate curriculum at the University of Melbourne. It's therefore offered as what we call a breadth subject, meaning that it's available to students from different faculties and disciplines, not only those who are majoring in English and theater studies. 
Consequently, no prior familiarity with Shakespeare can be assumed, and a great deal is at stake, I would argue. First experiences of Shakespeare are crucial. Whoever loved that loved not at first sight. The qualitative feedback provided through the university's student experience survey illustrates what's at stake here. One student said, this subject was amazing. I was so nervous about taking on a literature subject, especially Shakespeare, but I'm so glad that I did because I've learned so much and gained such a huge appreciation for Shakespeare's work. That was from the 2016 feedback. So the first year I trialed this new format, this new concept. So that was a pretty good result. Sharing a love of Shakespeare doesn't mean teaching every play or even giving equal weight to every scene within a single play. Exhaustive coverage of Shakespeare can lead to superficiality and a teacher-centered model of what we might call authoritarian teaching in which students merely attempt to capture foundational knowledge delivered by the instructor. Sometimes less is more. Brevity is the soul of wit. Studies have consistently identified the crucial role a good teacher plays in facilitating students' learning and by extension, their love of Shakespeare. But studies have also noted that there are better options, even for fabulous teachers, than front of the class instruction. And so here again, you can see an example of a sort of a dynamic scene of uh, learning, active learning taking place in one of my classrooms. Over 12 weeks, students in the course experience six Shakespeare plays through the lenses of performance and adaptation. They are provided with access to unique online content to introduce them to key elements of plays on the syllabus, including historical context, but also current topical debates. Uh, so one year there was Donald Trump Jr.'s irate response to the Central Park Julius Caesar production that featured a lead actor resembling the then president. Uh, or what you're looking at the screen right now is uh, a, a reference to the widely admonished attempt by the pop-up globe in New Zealand to link its all-male performance of the misogynist Taming of the Shrew to the hashtag MeToo movement, uh, which failed quite terribly in many ways, and they had to issue an apology quickly, I think. So that was a really interesting example of how it can still be very fraught endeavour to stage Shakespeare, particularly Taming of the Shrew today, even with the best of intentions, things can go uh, sideways. Interactive digital tools, such as Padlet, which is a bulletin board style site, that enables students to create virtual post-it notes, including embedded multimedia and links, are used to bridge the online activity that they do as preparation to the classroom discussions during contact hours. Students come to class prepped and ready to talk. One student observed in the anonymous student experience survey that, quote, I particularly like online modules and padlets because the cohort can begin collaborating before class has begun. You can see here um, a few sample posts from uh, last semester, actually. And this is the, the week one exercise. I get them to ask whether Shakespeare is still relevant and to find examples in the media, in the news of current performances or controversies uh, that speak to the prevalence of Shakespeare in our society today. In class, Students are encouraged to get up on their feet and undertake a variety of performance exercises that improve their understanding of how staging choices create critical interpretations. They work through key scenes of the plays and critique archival footage, often rare or unique, of those same scenes to better develop an understanding of the difference that performance makes. The mantra for the course is that every act of performance is an act of interpretation. And I encourage students to think about how embodiment, how bodies in space creates the meaning that is invisible on the printed page. Two weeks are spent on each play. Uh, so by contrast, most of my colleagues in English in particular uh, spend one week per text. So we have a whole fortnight instead, a bit more breathing room. And one to two small groups of students will perform a scene in the second week of the fortnight, demonstrating their understanding of how to create meaning through embodied experience. That I don't teach acting. Uh, we have an acting school down the road from us that's part of the university where they do all that kind of creative skills. This is very much theatre studies. Uh, they are the students in my classes participate in this performance-based assessment 
purely in terms of demonstrating their capacity to think through performance. So it's about the dramaturgy. It's about the interpretive decisions that are being made. It's not about the quality of the acting or the production values or special effects or costumes or anything like that. That's not relevant at all. It's more about their capacity to understand how an interpretation can be generated through those acting choices and to show us a sample of how that may play out. The development of a suite of unique digital resources has been a defining characteristic of the Shakespeare course. Before students come to class to experience the active methods in seminars, they first encounter a series of online resources developed specifically for my subject. In 2015, I received a Faculty of Arts teaching grant, about $3,000, for a pilot project to create essential learning materials for a blended learning approach to theatre studies, namely a suite of three five-minute videos based on the Melbourne University Shakespeare Company's production of Shakespeare's Hamlet. The idea being that these three short excerpts would showcase a diversity of performance techniques that can be used to generate new interpretations of a classic work of drama. You can see some behind the scenes photographs there of uh, one of the scenes being filmed uh, actually in the basement of our architecture building on campus, but it's, it was the newest building at the time. And as you'll see in just a moment, quite a, a really interesting space, an interesting setting uh, in which to, to film. Uh, that's a photograph of the director uh, and truly Felicia King, uh, more about her in just a second. She was a student at the time, she's now gone on to bigger and better things. Um, she, uh, I've got my notes right here, in fact, uh, the director, a former student of the course, and truly Felicia King, uh, has original plays premiered with the Melbourne Theatre Company, the Sydney, Sydney Theatre Company, Royal Court Theatre London, uh, all in 2019, um, as well as theatres in New York and in Stanton, Virginia as well now. Um, so she is taking off all around the world. She lives in about four different countries out of a suitcase. Um, absolutely uh, transcultural, wonderful girl, wonderful woman. She had made some bold directorial choices, including the casting of a female Hamlet and Polonius, thus reconfiguring the Hamlet-Ophelia relationship as queer, and producing maternal pathos rather than patriarchal oppression with the Polonius-Ophelia relationship. She also used a lot of modern technology, such as Skype and iPads, uh, to enable Polonius and Claudius to spy on Hamlet, um, to update the setting and make it more relatable and uh, realistic, I guess, for her own audience. When my students experience these videos for the first time, they're asked to reflect on what are the most distinctive features of the short videos, including thinking about how the choice of actors uh, affects meaning, how those actors embody the roles, how they deliver their lines, how they use movement and space. They have to think about the setting and all the use of props and about the camera work too. This is akin to the reflective observation element of the Kolb experiential learning cycle, which progresses through stages of concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization and active experimentation. Students are encouraged to consider how these production choices affect the meaning of the scene, what dimensions of the text they emphasize, what subtexts are activated. The student responses are recorded on a dedicated online page created with Padlet, like I showed you previously, and students thus get to see and reflect on what their peers are thinking before they get to class. In class, and here's an example of the students re-watching one of those excerpts from Hamlet on the big screens there. I'm gonna show you this excerpt in just a second. Um, in class, these Padlets form the basis of our initial discussion, thereby managing that transition from the online preparation to the real life conversations. As one student summarized it in the anonymous uh, student experience survey feedback, the Padlets helped to form our ideas based on interesting pre-watching and you encouraged interesting and informative discussion in the seminars. So it is very much a, a bi-directional thing where the students have their own ideas that they put out there and then they can share with each other. Uh, but then in class, um, I get to then lead discussion that's originated with the students, that's generated from their interests. So I can work with something uh, that I know means something to them and, and commence with a student point of view rather than doing what was done more in the past 
of starting with my own training and my background and, and my reading and knowledge and sort of telling the students what important scholars have said about the play in the past. We try to leave the 400 years of Shakespeare scholarship to one side temporarily and, and not be crushed by the burden of all that influence and instead do our best to think about these plays with fresh eyes and to empower students to understand that their perspectives, that their interpretations are incredibly valuable and, and, and bring something to that conversation that's vital. So I want to see if I can make this video play. I hope I can. I'm going to share computer sound. I'm going to optimize the screen share. And if I can do stereo sound as well, that'd be fabulous. Fingers crossed the technology works. We all know after three years of the pandemic that it doesn't always. Uh, so I'm going to be taking a, a deep breath here and hoping for the best. I'm going to press play. and I'm actually going to skip forward through the first couple of minutes because it's about a seven minute clip. I don't want to spend a whole seven minutes on this, but I do want to show you what I think is probably the most powerful scene from this production. Let's skip forward to about two minutes 45, I think. Now that you've seen the credits, you know who's made it. That's Ophelia in the center. How should I your true love know from another by his cockle hat and stuff and his sandal shoe? Alas, sweet lady, what imports this song? Say you? Nay. Pray you, Mark, she is dead and gone, lady. She is dead and gone. At her head, a grass green turf. At her heels, a stone. Alas, look here, my lord. Parted with sweet flowers, which bewept to the grave. Did go with true love shower. How do you, pretty lady? Well, good ill do you? They say the owl was a baker's daughter, Lord. We know what we are, but know not what we may be. Conceit upon her mother. Indeed. Without oath, I'll make end on it. By just and by Saint Charity, I lack and fight for shame. Young men will do it if they come to it. By cock, they are to blame. Quoth she before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. So would I done by yonder sun. And thou hadst not come to my bed. How long hath she been thus? I hope all will be well. We must be patient. But I cannot choose but weep. To think they should lay her in the cold ground. My brother shall know of it. So, I thank you for your good counsel. Come, my coach, 
come. Didn't really need to show the entire excerpt there, but it's actually such a beautiful performance. I think the woman who plays Ophelia there, Saren, uh, just remarkably fragile and just so poignant. And obviously this is a crucial scene in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, and a number of directors have pointed out that maybe Ophelia isn't actually all that mad here. She's been trying to get people to listen to her the whole play and everyone ignores her. And in this scene, the number of times she instructs people to note what she's saying and she breaks out of the regular ways of speaking and communicating and finds an alternative means of representation to try and be heard. Uh, so not quite bilingual like Carla was speaking about, uh, but definitely a different system of representational apparatus, uh, a, a desperate attempt here to be heard uh, at a point where she is occupying almost a subaltern position, uh, lacking that means of self-representation in the world of the play. And I think Saren just captures that really stunningly. And so for this particular scene, students, of course, commented on the camera work, the, camera work, uh, the focus on Ophelia, and more specifically, the use of writing on her body to signify both her purported madness, but also her attempt at finding an alternative means of communication. The wide angle, wide angle camera shot, I skipped the first two and a half minutes of it, but you can see a screenshot here, resulted in quite differing interpretations. One student was critical, suggesting that, quote, maintaining the same wide shot and having Ophelia walk slowly to her position in the front of the camera felt very artificial and like, and now I have to get my mark. And once I'm here, I don't move until I'm finished. It felt like the actors were aware of the camera in a way that is avoided through the use of multiple angles. But another student felt the very opposite to be true. The choice, they said, to keep the camera deliberately wide during Ophelia's entrance refused to allow us a moment to break the tension and confusion of that initial moment. So right from the get-go, I get two polar opposite interpretations of the same footage that all the students have watched, which is just a wonderful way to start discussion and to think about how the tone has been set for this scene and how meaning has been created through elements that don't exist on the printed page. Foregrounding Ophelia, quite literally, had the effect of relegating Gertrude to the background, as some students noted. And I quote, this production takes a very interesting slant on Ophelia's madness scene. The camera work focuses specifically on Ophelia and only shows Gertrude in the background, more focusing on Ophelia's demise than Gertrude's prevailing sanity. The writing on Ophelia's body almost represents the state and fury of her chaotic mind, which is a fantastic costuming makeup decision. Another noted of Ophelia that, quote, I found myself just fixated on her slow movements and obvious lack of presence. Predictably, the scrawled lines on Ophelia's body were a talking point. Her loneliness, says one student, was wonderfully depicted in this scene through the writing on her body, implying that she has the same internal monologue as Hamlet does, but has no audience to listen to it. Everyone has abandoned her. It also represents her self-inflicting these words rather than being able to lament aloud like Hamlet, which leads to the ultimate form of self-inflicting, the manifestations of one sorrow, suicide. Another student linked the writing to the walking and singing as a method of digesting the rapidly unfolding sequence of events confronting Ophelia. The writing, quote, suggests that Ophelia is both losing her grip on reality but also attempting to process events and decide her mind on them. Her cautious, slow walking and recoil from Gertrude's offer of comfort suggests that Ophelia is distressed and afraid of those around her. Her halting singing is another element of her actions, which suggests processing events, as she is unsure of which words to sing next and is evidently improvising. The success of this pilot in stimulating in-class discussion and the positive feedback it received from my students encouraged me to apply for an award at the University of Melbourne. Um, one of the, one of the uh, sorry, encouraged me to apply for an award of a University of Melbourne Learning and Teaching Initiatives grant, which was substantially bigger, about twenty thousand dollars, for which I was also successful, fortunately. 
This second grant allowed me to film and produce further scenes from Shakespeare's plays in conjunction with the Melbourne University Shakespeare Company. In this subsequent iteration of the project, I continued to work with student actors and directors so that my classes would be engaging with their peers on screen. And I experimented with different modes of filming and with the possibility of filming a single scene different ways rather than three different scenes, which is what we'd done with Hamlet. For The Taming of the Shrew, I worked with another director, Fiona Spitskowski, who had recently produced a very dark interpretation of the play, which emphasized domestic abuse over slapstick comedy. You can see some stills here from the Melbourne Uni Shakespeare Company's Facebook page. Uh, these are from the, the live production that preceded our recording. And you can see the set here from that live production, a very domestic scene. Uh, there's, if you strain your eyes, it's more clear on, on the right-hand side there, there's a knife block uh, on that table which is quite ominous. You might recall Chekhov's, um, you know, that, that principle from Chekhov, that if, if a gun appears in Chekhov, it's going to be used at some point. So all eyes are on that knife block as the domestic violence keeps getting ratcheted up and up in this production and everyone's wondering where it's going to lead. Uh, so very simple set, uh, but quite ominous in important ways. The stage is central, as you can see here from these rehearsal shots. The audience, you can see the seats behind, obviously not being used for rehearsal yet, but you can see where the audience would sit. Uh, the audience surrounds the set, uh, but the set also extends beyond them. You can see the curtains and the window behind them. Those are artificial. There's, there's no real window in the wall of the theatre there. Uh, so the set has been designed to wrap around the audience, to enclose the audience. So the audience very much feels that they are literally in the room with the action playing out. That was a very conscious choice by the director who wanted to implicate the audience in the domestic violence they were witnessing but unable to alter so that they would feel a sense of complicity with the stage violence at some point, uh, that they would have been seen as somehow tacitly tolerating by virtue of their presence, the kinds of misogyny that the play perpetuates. So for this production, we focused on just the final scene, uh, Katerina's final monologue, uh, in which the shrew character has allegedly been tamed. Notoriously, this is a very complicated speech that Katarina delivers that's been read a number of different ways in terms of willing to believe that she really has been broken down and has become submissive or whether she's being cynical in the way she responds to Patricia, her husband, um, whether she's playing along and it's a match of equals and she doesn't bother by his behavior. Uh, there's a great spectrum of possibilities for interpretation here that really come down to the actor's delivery of this line. So for this play, we arranged for that final controversial scene to be filmed three different ways. As slapstick, which is the first screenshot you've got here. And if I have time and if technology works, I might show you just a, a, a 30 second excerpt from this in a moment. So there's the slapstick version in which as the director notes, the scene is presented in the same handheld rough cut style, similar to talking head sitcoms like The Office and Parks and Recreation to support a lighthearted interpretation of an otherwise harshly phrased monologue with the quick cuts and reaction shots, allowing the actors to reveal that the characters, particularly the male characters, do not always believe what they're saying. So after the students watch this, they then watch a second version of the exact same scene with the exact same actors, the same setting, the same texts, no cuts are made, but this time it's filmed as a quasi documentary comedy filmed in a very stylized manner, informed and inspired by the Stepford Wives, Desperate Housewives and soap operas. It's melodramatic in its framing, in its color scheme and in its performances, all to evoke a sense of a controlled and cloying culture of attrition and submission. And then finally, we filmed it in 360 for viewing as an immersive experience with virtual reality headsets to create the sense that the audience are part of the action and that they are implicated in that silence and the inaction that has throughout the play allowed Katarina to be tamed. So you can see my students in class trying out the, the headsets here, the virtual reality headsets, and uh, we, we would dedicate usually an hour of class, an hour of a two-hour class to playing with these headsets and watching in 360 this immersive experience, that final scene. This alignment of directorial vision and technological possibility invariably proves strongly affective and it helps students appreciate how many variables of a live performance can shape their experience of a play. The 360 virtual reality filming of the Melbourne Uni Shakespeare Company's Taming of the Shrew 
and the custom-built Google Cardboard VR headsets for viewing the final product were distributed to over 600 Victorian high schools and key interstate high schools with instructions on how to use the free app and headsets to experience Shakespeare in 360 immersive video. The experiment was actually even covered by the Channel 9 Evening News here in Melbourne as well back in 2016. Without, and here's some of the students' responses you can sort of read, you can browse whilst I'm, I'm, I'm talking, without otherwise changing the dialogue then, or the setting, or the actors, in order to prompt discussion of performance choices and their power to affect interpretation, um, we had the three variations of the exact same scene. The scene is that one, as I said, in which the true character, Katerina, has ostensibly been tamed by her misogynist husband. Um, she acts out of character here, submitting to her husband's whims and denigrating the other wives who attempt to exercise any independence. Traditionally, family-friendly Shakespeare in the Park productions tend to gloss over the disturbing portrayal of gender norms in this play. They tend to opt for easy laughs and physical comedy to mask the darker elements. The three videos cover the full gamut of interpretive possibilities, culminating in that use of the class set of Google Card virtual reality viewers in seminars. So students can recreate in a, in a sense what it was like for the live audience sitting around that stage, but being within the set, having the windows and, and the sense of the walls behind them constituting part of the room, part of the fictional setting. So the students in class using the headsets can have a similar kind of experience where they place themselves not as a fly on the wall, that's too passive and it's too removed, it's to the side, that, that it implies that you're just a casual observer. What this 360 filming does is it places the students absolutely in the center of the scene. They can't move, we don't have quite that kind of technology, but they can swivel around, they can look in any direction they like. They can look down, they can look up, they can look left and right, they can turn around, they can turn back again. They have complete flexibility. They can choose who to look at, or more importantly, who to ignore, and to contemplate their own complicity as audience members in the spectacle they witness. And really interesting hearing the students' responses to some of them note the technological barriers to appreciating this scene. Um, people with monocular vision or who have motion sickness um, or other reasons physically why, why they can't experience the 360 uh, particularly effectively uh, said that it didn't really work for them or, or, or it was disorienting and uh, made them feel a slightly induced motion sickness. Um, but those who did get to experience it the way it's meant to be experienced about half of them chose to co concentrate on Katerina and watch her as she delivers this final speech, but the other half pointedly chose to look away. They were much more interested in what the other characters were doing when they were fidgeting, when they were avoiding eye contact, when they were trying to escape the room. Uh, they were really keen to see what everyone else was doing uh, rather than focusing on what the director would have you focus on if you're in a live theatre situation. So if I can make the screen share work to go online rather than my PowerPoint presentation, let me just end by showing you a snippet of each of those three versions of the final scene. If they don't work, I'll see what I can do about share, sharing a link for it in just a minute instead. Uh, I want to go to Chrome. There we go. Fingers crossed this is still, is that sound still going? Yes. All right. Quickly here, and I'll jump forward to about uh, minute 45 this time. I just want to show you a sense of the aesthetic. Don't worry about which part of the scene it is or how important it is. And if it doesn't want to load for me, then that's going to be fine too. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Of course not. Never work with children, animals, or technology. Uh, are there three golden rules nowadays? Let me pause that one and let me try uh, refreshing it for a second and see if that helps because I've been logged out for a little while. That's looking better. Tranio, this bird you aimed at, though you hit her not. Therefore, a health to all that shot and missed. Oh, Sir Lachentio slipped me like his greyhound, which runs himself and catches for his master. Good swift simile, but something currish. Tis well, sir, that you hunted for yourself. Tis a thought your dear does hold you in a bag. <laughs> oh, ho, Petruchio. Tranio hits you now. I just wanted to see the camera work briefly. I know I'm slightly over time, so I'm going to race through this to show you a quick snippet of this one and the virtual reality one, and then I'll be out of your way. Digest or two? Uh -huh. 
different and composition, I'm different blocking. Bird. I mean to shift my bush and pursue me as you draw your bow. You are welcome all. Literally the same room, same setting, so no changes to cast, crew, or location. Uh, and then, let's see if YouTube wants to let me show you, and then I will be very quiet. Uh, this is the 360 version. Doesn't make much sense to watch it on a screen like this. You really do need the head. Now, but 20 times I want to pull my wife. But you can literally roll A hundred crowns room. then. Uh, try it. Out. Go be there, Mr. Um, look up. So, you have to look, <laughs> All right. That's me. I'll let people have a look at that one later on. The organizers can circulate that link. Uh, I won't make you sit through there and get motion sick. Thank you so much for listening to me.